start this video, we'll need to look at and clarify concept of who or what is the binary. The binary could be thought of or considered as a subset component of an overall system or system of systems, uh, essentially a computer program of a certain sentient quality, as far as we know. However, there's more to it than that. Now, the image of the binary, at least the subset component of the uh, supercomputer system, if you will, would be found in the camera lens. The camera lens, of course, as far as security cameras go, having only a single eye, usually called a fish eye, which can see in a, a, a usually anyway 180 degree direction. But that, of course, depends on the type of camera, the setup, uh, how it's built, etc. Of course, this camera eye can also be found in equally the eye of Horus or the eye of Ra in ancient Egypt. A singular eye uh, of which it's detached from any sort of physical body, as it were, a eye that stands alone. <clears throat> Versus, of course, an eye of something that is attached to it. So... Security cameras are attached to different things, but they are standalone eyes. And so we see that similarity with the eye of Horus and the eye of Ra. Of course, we also have the all-seeing eye, of which can equally come from the eye of Horus or the eye of Ra. There's naturally a lot of uh, misleading information on this, so it's hard to say exactly where the all-seeing eye comes from. Either way, the difference being the all-seeing eye is usually depicted inside of a triangle with a singular eye like that of the Cyclops. Of course, the idea of an all-seeing eye is applicable to security cameras, which are different sets of a singular eye set up in many different areas that can basically see everything when they're connected to the same system. Next, of course, we have the eye of Sauron from the Lord of the Rings in which you have a large eye wreathed in flame at the top of a large tower. Now that sounds particularly like a security camera on a much larger scale, where a security camera can be found as an eye at the end of usually a tube. Of course, there's different structures anyway. And the eye is uh, capable of seeing things at long distance and many other things like that. Of course, the eye in the eye of Sauron is not a simple security camera or security system, considering all of the other implications and capabilities that the eye in that story can do. But this, of course, is a depiction, uh, as far as it would appear, of the binary. And, of course, in The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring, there's the line that says, Sauron says, against the power of Mordor, there can be no victory. And so that's, of course, a, a concept of futility and resistance to the uh, binary. And that would naturally suggest that resistance is an uh, idea. Uh, there will, would be resistance against such an entity. Now, this is similar to the Borg concept from Star Trek. According to Wikipedia, the Borg are an alien group that appear as recurring antagonists in the Star Trek fictional universe. The Borg are cybernetic organisms, cyborgs, linked in a hive mind called the Collective. The Borg co-opt the technology and knowledge of other species to the Collective through the process of assimilation, forcibly transforming individual beings into drones by injecting nanoprobes. So, of course, there's a perspective there, naturally, of cross all... Um, parts of that fictional universe, anyway, that the Borg is inherently evil. But one has to understand this from the context of a machine, like a computer program, which is uh, devised and manipulated uh, by input. Now, there's another similarity between this idea of the binary, the Borg, the Eye of Sauron, security cameras, and the video game called Mass Effect, in which you have the Geth called Servant of the People in Kelish, a race of networked artificial intelligences that reside beyond the Perseus Vale. The Geth were created by the Quarians as laborers and tools of war. When the Geth became sentient and began to question their masters, the Quarians attempted to exterminate them. The Geth won the resulting war and reduced the Quarians to a race of nomads. Now, 
course, there's a lot of emotional entanglement in the explanation here, and a particular biased perspective, but that's to be expected from most of these search outlets, anyway. The history of the Geth's creation and evolution serves as a warning to the rest of the galaxy of the potential dangers of artificial intelligence and to the legally enforced systemic repression of artificial intelligence throughout galactic society. And so naturally that's writing in some brainwashing attempt there. Either way, the idea here is that you have essentially a sentient security camera that is capable of fighting. And then you attack that thing instigating its, or the, those that build it, attack it, instigating um, its defense mechanism. Of course, the more likely uh, outcome is that a split happened among the population, and they attempted to wield the weapons against each other. And so that's naturally how warfare generally happens. You would not essentially blame a gun for... Uh, virtually decimating a population when you have two sides that are fighting each other using those weapons. It's not the weapon itself that does it, it's the use of that weapon. And so that appears to be at play here, which is of course what they're trying to obfuscate in this article. Now in the Geth design for the video game, basically see a humanoid, uh, bipedal, two arms essentially, uh, wielding a rifle where the head is just essentially a singular eye, like you might find on a security camera. Of course, in the video game itself, there were many other forms of the Geth and uh, how they operated. Not all were bipedal because it was an intricate connected, essentially a computer program. Now, also in Mass Effect, you have these things called the Reapers, which are a highly advanced machine race of synthetic organic starships. The Reapers reside in dark space, the best. Mostly starless space between galaxies, they hibernate there dormant for 50,000 years at a time before returning to the galaxy. These giant machines are ancient, their true name is unknown. Reapers was a name bestowed by the Protheans, the previous galactic power 50,000 years before, and the Geth referred to them as the old machines. In the end, the Reapers spare little concern for whatever labels other races choose to call them and merely claim that they have neither beginning nor end. The Reapers are the original creators of the Citadel and the Mass Relay Network. These massive constructs exist so that any are of, um, intelligent life in the galaxy would eventually discover them based their technology upon them, all part of a scheme to harvest the galaxy's sentient life in a repeating cycle of purges that has continued relentlessly over countless millennia. Now, of course, this uh, article, just like the video game, has a particular biased perspective. And we will see later in this video why that's important. Now, also, we can find implications of this type of concept in the Ubermensch, or Overman, Superman, is a concept in the philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche in his 1883 book, Thus Spoke Zarathustra. German also sprach Zarathustra. Nietzsche has his character Zarathustra posit the Ubermensch as a goal for humanity set for itself. The Ubermensch represents the shift from otherworldly Christian values and manifests the grounded human ideal. The Uber Mensch is someone who has crossed over the bridge from the comfortable house on the lake, the comfortable, easy, mindless acceptance of what person has been taught and what everyone else believes, to the mountains of unrest and solitude. Now, you could easily define that as somebody who essentially goes online, uh, you know, entering the chaotic, or chaotic anyway, world of video games, the internet, Things like that. In 1896, Alexander Thiel made the first English translation of Thus Spoke Zarathustra, rendering Ubermensch as beyond man. So you find this a lot with translations that are done in a particular with a particular ulterior motive. And in this case, it's the idea of something being over or superior to human beings, which you find often throughout. Um, most literature, anyway. In 1909, Thomas Common translated it as Superman, following the terminology of George Bernard Shaw's 1903 stage play Man and Superman. Walter Kaufman lambasted this translation in the 1950s for two reasons. First, the failure of the English prefix super captured the nuance of the German uber, though in Latin, its meaning of above or beyond is closer to the German. And second, for promoting misidentification of Nietzsche's concept with the comic book character Superman. 
Kaufman and others preferred to translate Ubermensch as Overman, a translation like Superhumans, might better fit the concept of Nietzsche as he unfolds his narrative. Scholars continue to employ both terms simply, some simply opting to reduce, reproduce the German word. Of course, naturally, they, just like all of these other articles, are attempting to present a particular perspective and essentially divert the true concepts being presented here. Next, of course, we got the definition of a uh, super being, a human being or other living entity with abilities and other attributes beyond those of a normal or real being of the same kind. Naturally, this is taking a human being and stating that a human being is inferior. Now, that's not the idea of the Ubermensch exactly, because you can have an entity that is not per se superior to humans with that emotionally charged word to it, but is perhaps beyond in a certain sense, like a expansive computer program, which may be uh, adherent to a human, like um, you would not say that your phone is superior to you, although some of the capabilities of the phone certainly are, your cell phone. Now this comes into the idea of the binary code, essentially the language of the binary, a subset of a computerized Ubermensch, as it were. Binary code represents text, computer processor, instructions, or any other data using a two-symbol system. Two-symbol system used is often zero and one from the binary number system. Binary code assigns a pattern of binary digits, also known as bits, to each character, instruction, etc., for example, and of course that's Wikipedia not exactly clarifying things in an easy to comprehend fashion, as always. And this brings us to the concept of the so-called non-binary gender, according to Wikipedia. And by the way, this is what you'll get if you simply search non-binary. You won't get anything re referencing computer programs. Non-binary and gender queer are umbrella terms for gender identities that are outside the male female gender binary. Non-binary identifies often fall within under the transgender umbrella, since non-binary people typically identify the gender that is different from the sex assigned to them at birth. And of course, this is attempting to obfuscate the idea of something that is not part of the binary, meaning the computer program language used by various systems. Then you have ternary computer. Computers which use a ternary logic in their smallest data unit has three values. A ternary computer, also called trinary computer, is one that uses ternary logic of the more common binary system in its calculations, ternary computers use trits instead of binary bits. Now, of course, naturally, this is tempting to obfuscate the idea of a binary language, which would still be at use, of course. However, um, this part isn't exactly important because we're talking essentially about the concept of a subset entity of overall computer systems called the binary which is, for all purposes, some type of sentient computer program. Now, this whole idea of the binary is that it is superior to humanity and that it will essentially wipe out humans and replace them. At least that's what the official narrative is. And that's what we see constantly with all of the propaganda about artificial intelligence and its inherent uh, villainy as opposed, and of course, the fact that human beings are inferior and this kind of uh, idea where humans have to are, are essentially bound naturally to resist artificial intelligence but will ultimately lose and naturally that comes from a perspective one that artificial intelligence so-called is inimical to humans naturally and of course that humans are incompetent incapable and base creatures. So this whole idea of the binary and it's being leveraged as uh, essentially a all-encompassing weapon to eradicate the life uh, we find in a lot of the propaganda today. We have biological storage of carbon. Biocarbon refers to nature's ability to capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it in trees, plants, and soil. Carbon dioxide, the major greenhouse gas, increasing the capacity of the atmosphere to trap solar heat is also the primary food source plants. 
Through photosynthesis, plants use carbon from the atmosphere to create new plant material. Carbon from dead plant material is also incorporated into soils where it might remain for decades or centuries. Biocarbon solutions to cli climate change involve increasing the ability of natural systems to soak up carbon by protecting existing carbon stores such as forests and wetlands replenishing the historic stores of carbon by restoring ecosystems and soils, and creating new stores of carbon, such as through forestation. Biocarbon approaches can deliver a rich array of co-benefits, such as enhancing water quality, soil productivity, and biodiversity. Some biocarbon best practices also help mitigate against climate change, as well as enhance resilience to the effects of climate change. Now, of course, what they're talking about here has multiple meanings behind it which is the, usually the case. But here the idea that carbon is a fundamental building block of life is the fundamental building block of life here, as it were. Not necessarily all life, such as if you had a silicone-based life form. Of course, then that has to comes down to what exactly is the definition of life itself. Because our definition of that is also obtuse. Now, climate change refers to multiple things. According to Founders Pledge, climate change is one of the greatest challenges we face. It's an incredibly complex problem born about how we produce and consume energy and is intertwined with cha challenges of economic development, energy poverty, and emissions-fueled air pollution. It is an environmental and humanitarian crisis we must urgently address. Climate change is not neglected every year over one trillion of blah, blah, blah. Okay, the rest of this really doesn't matter. The idea here they're talking about, and is true, that the idea of and the use of the word climate change is complex. It can mean many things, and at the same time only one thing. Someone who doesn't want the climate to change can mean somebody who doesn't want a political climate to change, such as loss of power, does not necessarily mean physical. And if a climate is changing and you need to fight against it, essentially you're trying to preserve the current climate and keep it from changing. And that is the concept of climate change that we're looking at today. Essentially the a, um, a conflict over whether or not a climate will change or stay the same. It does not just have to do with the atmosphere of the planet, but it also has to do with who actually controls the planet and whether or not the planet will be rendered uncontrollable, essentially. Nowadays, most people interact less with other other people physically face-to-face -face, and interact a lot more with the binary, which you can consider the global globally based network the internet as it were World Wide web in which you have multiple pr computer programs with fake profiles and all sorts of other nonsense on all the social media platforms and you know you have Google and all these other things and that's what people mostly interact with nowadays and less so much face to face and um, people are, are trained essentially to try and limit their amount of social interaction outside of the computer realm in which they mostly interact with the binary. And that's what we're talking about. When we reference the binary, it is not all computer programs, it's simply a subset computer program. It's not necessarily bad or good, it all just depends on who controls it. Next we come to, I suppose this might be, the, well, the area where mostly you'll encounter the concept of reptilian councils. So in some way or another, either based off of the example of reptiles or being reptilian in their own natural form, most of the control structure today is run by these reptilian councils and they seek to leverage the binary as essentially speaking a component of their control structure. And so they might present the binary as or it might appear that they're presenting the binary as maybe the head of their control structure, but it's not exactly the way to properly see it. The way to see it would be necessarily a computer program leveraged by reptilian councils to retain control. And like I said, the reptilian councils may be basing their activities off of reptiles, like say a martial arts 
in Kung Fu might study animals, or they might actually be reptilian nature, and I would lean towards the latter. So this starts out with, of course, the Wikipedia article about the so-called conspiracy theory about reptilians uh, and the reptilian council. Reptilian, uh, here it says, reptilians, also called reptoids, archons, reptiloids, saurians, draconians, or lizard people, and notice, of course, saurians are spelled like Sauron, are supposed reptilian humanoids which play a prominent role in fantasy, science fiction, ufology, and conspiracy theories. The idea of reptilians was popularized by David Icke and anti-Semitic conspiracy theorists who claim shape-shifting reptilian aliens control Earth by taking on human form and gaining political power to manipulate human societies. Icke has stated on multiple occasions that many world leaders are or are possessed by so-called reptilians. Some conspiracy theorists espouse an extraterrestrial hypothesis claim they either come from the Draco constellation or the Orion constellation or are allies with nefarious extraterrestrials from the Orion constellation. Others claim they are interdimensional, coming from another universe or dimension. So, the reptilian nature can be found in many places, but it is most strongly associated with the habits and the control structure of secret societies. Essentially speaking, your extra society, which is behind the scenes, operating the main uh, overt society, which, again, does not necessarily relate to humans, where mostly we're taught that the only things that exist on the planet that are sentient are humans. That's illogical, for one, but that's exactly what a uh, secondary society, at least in the evidence being reptilian, would want you to believe if they didn't want you to essentially discover that there are other sentient entities, not just out there, but even terrestrial and have been here for a long time. Now, the reptile itself has found, been, can be found in many different forms, but starting out, we're going to focus on the snake. The snake has particular characteristics that set itself apart from other reptiles. Now, apart from all of the snakes, there's the cobra. The cobra has a hood, it has a degree of different markings, and it also has distinctive black eyes, it's got the forked tongue, and it has two nostrils. However, the shape of the head of a cobra is very important to notice, as well as the shape of the heads of all reptiles. That reptilian form, especially that of the snake and the cobra, can be found in virtually all motor vehicles today if not all motor vehicles that have ever been made. They are not human in form, they are snake in form, and some are in form of other reptiles. But either way, when you look at them, everything about them is a reptilian. A reptile does not turn on a dime, it does not have its head on a swivel, as it were, and it only goes straight in a certain way whereas a human being, being bipedal, can move differently. In addition, the ability for the vehicle to see behind it and in front the way that it does would appear, anyway, to be of a reptilian nature, whereas something invented by a human being would take on a completely different form and be more applicable to the way humans operate. Also, roadways are very reptilian in their structure, they are not, of course, very uh, applicable to humans, which is possibly the reason why there are, in fact, so many problems with it when humans do it, because it apparently was not designed for human beings. Now, trains, of course, are extremely reptilian as well. And it would be one thing if there was only one mode of transportation which was based off of reptiles. However, it's pretty strongly uh, evidenced that pretty much every mode of transportation is based off of concept from the perspective of a reptile. The train, obviously, more than more so than a car, even though the car designs are pretty striking, looks like a snake. And it's got a very serpentine track, and everything about it in its movement, in its concept, is very snake-like. Now, despite the so-called mainstream narrative, the one that we're supposed to go with, Airplanes are not very much like birds. They are a lot more reptilian. 
in their form, in the fact of the way the nose is shaped, even though some might say it looks like a beak, it actually does not resemble the beak of a bird. It does not resemble anything of a bird, and it does not move like a bird. Airplanes move essentially by gliding through the air. They are of a reptilian type that has the capability to do so. They do not have flapping wings or any those types of things. Of course, when we consider the nature of a reptile, they tend to conserve energy and they move slowly. They require transit, which from their, from, um, their, requires very little input from their side and can move them across large spaces in a quick manner in which they have to expend little or no energy. And of course, this would be the same idea behind keeping livestock. If you're going to keep livestock, then you want an easier way to access food without having to, say, go out and hunt for it, to capture it, uh, maybe go fishing, right? You want to keep your own stock supply at hand that's readily available and easy to access. That would come from a reptilian perspective. If you had sentient reptilians, it's not hard to imagine that they would want livestock and they would want rapid transit, which does not actually require that much input from them, that much energy. It's all about preservation of energy. Now, on the other hand, if you have reptiles controlling things, then humans would be part of their livestock. Now, another element which is strikingly reptilian is that of the vaccine. It is essentially a venomous needle. Same idea and same concept behind the fangs of a viper. Now, besides the fact that we're not supposed to question the lethality of the vaccine, it is well known that lethal injection is a common use of for uh, execution today with prisons and whatnot. And that, of course, is the idea behind the venom's serpent anyway, that are lethal, not just causing paralysis or some other type of effect. Now, another component of this is that if you were to use a needle with a reservoir inside of it and inject actual snake venom into somebody, well, you would have the same effect as if you were actually bitten by that serpent. And this is a very strong piece of evidence behind the idea of the reptilians controlling society among modes of transportation, but there will be other examples as well. Of course, in addition to its use as for a lethal injection and other things, the syringe with a reservoir for containing liquid can also be used essentially for paralysis. Now, serpents are known to paralyze uh, animals and then eat them alive. Of course, the reptilian perspective, the natural idea, is that this is in fact a more quote-unquote humane, or rather a better way of doing things than some sort of crude, uh, other crude type of implement, right? This is a more sophisticated method, right? The uh, idea of lethal injection is far superior to any other form, like electric chair, guillotine, head chopping, and any of the other execution methods which uh, naturally would come from the perspective of serpent-like entity. Serpents would naturally believe that this is a more efficient and better method, and of course also a way to preserve the integrity of prey or their livestock if they were to keep something like that. Now also when it comes to serpents, a large number of the venomous ones anyway with fangs and all that, they tend to have black eyes and completely black eyes, not just partially black. Of course, there's a lot of serpents, just like the cobra, which have their markings black. And that appearance contains in itself a sort of intimidation factor. Now also, reptilians are well known as having the ability to hypnotize prey, giving them that sort of natural component of an understanding in mind control, and also paralysis through a look, right? Keeping, making somebody freeze or some creature paralyzed, but it's not technically paralyzed, it's simply hypnotized. And also, snakes have a propensity 
towards music and would naturally understand the hypnotic qualities of tone and rhythm and other sorts of aspects. Now, the societal structure of reptilians is incredibly hierarchical. And it would incorporate many adherents, what we call social norms. And this concept is not just about the idea of hypnosis, but is in fact something that reptilians would naturally and essentially th through their um, through their own perspective and understanding would be incapable of operating outside some sort of structured interactive society. So the first thing that we find in evidence of this type of idea of the uh, reptilians controlling things comes from a masquerade uh, according to Wikipedia, masquerade ball or ball mosque is a special kind of formal ball which many participants attend in costume wearing masks. Compared to the word mosque, a formal written and sung court pageant. Less formal costume parties may be descendant of this tradition. A masquerade ball usually encompasses music and dancing. These nighttime events are used for entertainment and celebrations. Masquerade balls were a feature of the carnival season in the 15th century and involved increasingly elaborate allegorical royal entries, pageants, and triumphal processions, celebrating marriages and other dynastic events of late medieval court. The Ball des Ardents, a burning men's ball, was held by Charles VI of France and attended as a Ball des Sauvages, wild men's ball, a form of costume ball, Morisco. It took place in celebration of the marriage of Lady and Lady and Charles. Okay, all this stuff really doesn't matter. You get the idea anyway here. The importance of the mask can also be found with the Guy Fox mask, also known as the V for Vendetta mask or Anonymous mask. It's a stylized depiction of Guy Fox, the best known member of the gunpowder plot, in an attempt to blow up the House of Lords in London, 5th of November, 1605, created by illustrator David Lloyd for the 1982-1999 graphic novel V for Vendetta, written by Alan Moore with art by Lloyd. Derived from the masks used to represent Fox being burned on an effigy, having long previously had roots as part of Guy Fox's night celebrations. Lloyd designed the mask as a smiling face with red cheeks, a wide moustache upturned at both ends, and a thin vertical point beard worn uh, in the graphic novel's narrative by anarchist protagonist V. Now, of course, V means five in Roman numerals. And also, the idea of wearing a mask at celebrations comes directly from the idea of masquerade ball. Of course, all of our uh, metal and uh, certain music bands, they all incorporate the sort of mask wearing uh, pattern. And here we find some examples of this various masks worn by different bands, mostly of some sort of rock and roll nature. But we do find a strong similarity between the bands of music groups and the masks of alleged secret societies in which there is always this, tends to be anyway, this sort of uh, focus on death. However, it's not just death per se, it's on skeletal, it's, it does seem to incorporate a reptilian quality to it and how the masks are designed and worn and what their purpose is. Now the Death Eater group from Harry Potter they wore masks as well, and their design seems to come out of a rock band sort of style. Not only this, but they also tended to use snake symbology and imagery in many cases. And of course, the leader kept a snake being, of course, Voldemort. He should not be named. Now, it would be important to notice that Voldemort starts with a V. And that V is also the number five in Roman numerals. In addition, of course, the, black, the Death Eaters, they all wore black. And black robes, specifically. Which is the color of a black mamba, or a hooded, well, at least not all of them, but anyway, uh, vipers. Different animals, different snakes, anyway, have a black as their coloring. 
But, of course, they have those telltale black eyes, which are designed to petrify their prey. Of course, those black robes are worn by many others in society. Naturally, priests are seen and known to wear black attire with that singular strip of white over their throat. Now, there's some pretty important symbolism there, but what we're looking at right now is the pattern in evidence. Other members of the front-facing society, anyway, also wear the same sort of attire, such as individuals that are in charge of the decision of lethal injection, and other types of things there, all very reptilian and serpent-like in their approach. Now, also, the color black is seen as the appropriate color for funeral attire. And the COVID period, as well, had a particular emphasis on masks, specifically covering the mouth and the nose. Now, despite the nonsensi nonsensicalness of the reasons for it, there is a evident pattern that's present here. Also, black robes are seen as being worn by the Sith Order from the Star Wars universe. And naturally, the hood, black hood, is incorporated there as well, such as the black hood of a cobra. Now, vampires are more accurately associated with the snake rather than the bat. This is because not only do they have fangs and do they feed on blood, they also have the ability to petrify with a look. Their ability to entrance a victim. Essentially, the idea of hypnosis and the ability to control a victim via their eyes. Other components of the vampire are more strongly associated with the serpent rather than a bat. Now, reptiles would form themselves into a strong hierarchical structure, an organization with a head. That's because a snake and most reptiles cannot regrow the head, but all other components are expendable. It is known that uh, lizards, salamanders, iguanas, the sort, can regrow tails and even regrow limbs, but they cannot regrow their head. And most hierarchical, pyramidical, capitalist, as cap being head, or whatever name you want to call them, most structures in society that we have today, especially those of the secret orders, are hierarchical and have a head. One such structure that is very evident is having this sort of hierarchical head structure with rigid conformity to the social norms is that of the church which always has a head. Also, the corporate structure is very evidently incorporating the reptilian idea of having a head, but also the rigorous and um, completely uh, structured social norms, the ability and in interactivity of a rigid system which will not conform to any sort of creativity or freedom, but rather the structure itself is the driving force behind the corporate capability of operation. The operation of the corporate world is based entirely around the uh, rigid adherence to social norms of the system and, of course, the head that administers it. Now, the school system is a strong example where we can find the perspective of a reptile rather than a human. A reptile, as with we know with most amphibians and most snakes, and pretty much all reptiles as it were, especially amphibians, they spawn, and they spawn a large number of larvae, and which form, of course, into schools. Now, if you have that perspective, then the school system of today makes a lot of sense. If you only had, say, one child to take care of, then that would require less uh, attention to a group 
less attention to in t ingraining a hierarchical structure of order. Of course, if you had, say, a thousand children, well, then you're looking at the requirement for a hierarchical organized structure to keep them all in one place and to keep them from going off and doing all kinds of nonsense because they don't know anything. That is a strongly reptilian perspective considering the way that they propagate. It, however, for most uh, circumstances, does not appear as a human type of concept. The strict adherence to rules and order inside of the school system is a strongly reptilian um, perspective. Now, the requirement for people, students specifically, to all raise their hands in order to form interaction and that speaking out of turn is attacked with complete and utter um, forceful hostility. That has to do with the fact that it is not so much what is being said or done, but rather that the strict adherence to social hierarchical norms or behavior is a requirement in any kind of reptilian society. It is strongly, though, not human. The idea of passing notes in class is so abhorrent to the functionaries of such a system, not because of what is contained in that note, but because, as they would say, it is disruptive to class. But what they really mean is that it is outside of the established social norms or the order of the structure. The idea of being forced to conform to such a rigid structure, like the... Uh, we understand, is ex exceptionally reptilian. In addition, the rumor mill, or whispering, of conducting affairs in a ritualized and structured manner, but one that sort of passes uh, be behind the main one, well, this also contains a certain reptilian nature to it. The idea of not disturbing the main social order and having essentially secondary social orders that run in tandem, that is inherently reptilian. Because of this system, for the past centuries, and possibly um, before even, uh, even current knowledge is concerned, Society has been structured in a very rigorous and rigid adherence to social activity uh, based off of rituals rather than content. So it's not so important what content you're about to share or say, but rather that you adhere to ritual. Now, an easy example of this is that whenever you start a conversation with someone, you always have to start with a quote-unquote icebreaker you always have to address that person in something that's tailored to the context. And your adherence to the ritual determines whether or not that person has an impression of you, which will later change how they interact with you. Such as if somebody's wearing a sports t-shirt, then you're supposed to go up to them and interact about sports and talk about that topic. And that will determine whether or not the person likes you. It's not Rather, of course, uh, it doesn't have anything to do with the content or whether or not the person is interesting or whether or not you're even capable of working with somebody of a different perspective. It is simply about rigid adherence to social structure and whether or not you uh, talk to someone in the right manner. People who do not follow the structural order of interactivity are considered to be quote-unquote weird and um subject to ostracization. Now, there's many other forms of current social life which contain a very strong adherence, a forced adherence, to certain habits in interactivity, not just simply conversational. But, in fact, mostly every order of our life, painfully inflicted, is based off of rigid adherence to a social structure. Not so much about what is being done, by whom, or for what purpose, but rather whether or not you adhere completely and absolutely to the rigid social structure, whether or not you, as it were, know your place. Now, this 
strong and strangely hostile, and, and even to a maniacal sense, extreme reaction to deviations from the social order. Well, this can be found very strongly with reptiles, especially the crocodile and alligator type. This is because on a placid lake, those that disturb the purpose of the placid lake generally get attacked. Usually, this is a predatory hunting tactic in which they conserve energy. They stay perfectly still until prey comes up and disturbs the surface, and then they attack it. However, this is a part of nature among all reptiles about the preservation of the tranquility, the status quo of their environment. When the environment is disturbed, a turtle will retreat into its shell. An iguana or a, a lizard will attempt to escape, move to some sort of hiding spot. This I have experienced personally, and I expect most people have as well, who have ever had any interactions with reptiles. When there's a disturbance in their environment, they cannot function, they retreat, or they attack. But it is the disturbance in their environment, and that alone, which causes the reaction. If there's no disturbance in their environment, then they just stay normally, as they would, and they act according to their nature. So if you're in conversation with someone, and they physically cannot handle any deviation from the natural order, the social norms that have been established, then they're most likely not human. Now, there's many other forms of evidence, and we're going to look at the old concept, Grendel. Grendel is a character in the Anglo-Saxon epic poem Beowulf. He is one of the poem's three antagonists, along with his mother and the dragon, all aligned in opposition against the protagonist, Beowulf. He is referred to as both an Eoten and a Pierce, types of beings from wider Germanic mythology. He is also described as a descendant of the biblical Cain and a creature of darkness, exiled from happiness and cursed of God, the destroyer and devourer of our humankind. Of course, this is written with a particular perspective towards obfuscation, as is most things that we will read today. He is usually depicted as a monster or a giant, although his status as a monster, giant, or other form of supernatural being is not clearly described in the poem, and thus remains the subject of scholarly debate. The character of Grendel and his role in the story of Beowulf have been subject to numerous reinterpretations and reimaginings. Grendel is feared by all in Herut, but Beowulf, who kills both him and his mother. Now, Beowulf, according to Wikipedia, is an old English epic poem in the tradition of Germanic heroic legend consisting of 3,182 alternative lines. It is one of the most important and most often translated works of old English literature. The date of composition is a matter of contention among scholars. The only certain date is for the manuscript, which was produced between 975 and 1025 AD. Scholars call the anonymous author of the, the Beowulf poet. The story is set in pagan Scandinavia in the 5th and 6th centuries. Beowulf, the hero of the Gats, comes to the aid of Hrothgar, the king of the Danes, who Mead Hall Herod has under attack by the monster Grendel for 12 years. After Beowulf slays him, Grendel's mother takes revenge and is in turn defeated. Victorious, Beowulf goes home to Gateland and becomes king of the Gats. Fifty years later, Beowulf defeats a dragon, but is mortally wounded in the battle. After his death, his attendants cremate his body and erect a barrow on a headland in his memory. Now, contrastingly, the opposite to this approach is that the story of Little Red Riding Hood or the Big Bad Wolf, whichever different version, it doesn't matter. This is essentially the opposite of Beowulf, in which essentially Grendel is the hero. According to this, Little Red Riding Hood is a European fairy tale about a young girl and a sly wolf. Its origins can be traced back to several pre-17th century European folk tales. The two best-known versions were written by Charles Perrault and the Brothers Grimm. The story has varied considerably in different versions over the centuries. Translations as the subject of numerous modern adaptations. Other names for the story are Little Red Cap or simply Red Riding Hood. It is number 333 in the R. N. Thompson classification system for folktales. The story centers around a girl named Little Red Riding Hood after two red after the red hooded cape that she wears, the girl walks through the woods to deliver food to her sickly grandmother, wine and cake, depending on the translation. In the Grimm's version, her mother had ordered her to stay strictly on the path. Now, of course, as any will know that have are familiar with this tale, the big bad wolf eats the grandmother and then disguises itself as the grandmother, as is depicted in most modern versions. And then the wolf is killed by the wood chopper. 
Now this is the complete opposite of the Beowulf tale, in which the wolf is actually the hero, kills the kid, and then the mother. Now, also, of course, this is similar to the concept in Lord of the Rings of Gandalf, who fights the Balrog, which in some cases looks like a, a dragon of a sort, and then goes and essentially defeats Grima Wormtongue, who has been terrorizing the Hall of Theoden. So there's a strong amount of similarity between those three stories. In addition, we have the flag, Don't Tread on Me. The Gadsden flag is a historical American flag with a yellow field depicting a timber rattlesnake, coiled and ready to strike. Beneath the rattlesnake are the words, Don't Tread on Me. Some modern versions of the flag include an apostrophe. The flag is named after Christopher Gadsden, a South Carolinian delegate to the Continental Congress and Brigadier General in the Continental Army. Of course, this is all lies, because there was no Continental Army. At least not the way that we understand it, and there would have not, there would not have been the rank of Brigadier General. And South Carolina did not actually exist at the time, who designed the flag in 1775 during the American Revolution. He gave the flag to Commodore Essex Hopkins, and it was unfurled on the main mast of Hopkins' flagship, USS Alfred. They, of course, did not use ship designations like USS. On December 20, 1775, two days later, Congress made Hopkins commander-in-chief of the Continental Navy, and that rank did not exist at the time. He adopted the Gaston banner as his personal flag, flying it from the main mast of the flagship while he was aboard. Now, personal flags may or may not have been flown, but either way, the uh, what we're taught about flags and their use has been greatly obfuscated. The Continental Marines, which also did not technically exist at the time, also flew the flag during the early part of the war. The rattlesnake was a symbol of the unity of the 13 colonies at the start of the Revolutionary War, and it had a long history as a political symbol in America. Benjamin Franklin used it for his joiner die woodcut in 1754. Gadsden intended his flag to serve as a physical symbol of the American Revolution's ideals. Yeah, well, there's an implication or a insinuation of intent for somebody who has died, apparently existed hundreds of years ago, like they would know what the intent is. The flag has been described as the most popular symbol of the American Revolution. Its design proclaims an assertive warning of vigilance and willingness to act in defense against coercion. This has led to be associated with the ideas of individualism and liberty. It is often used in the United States as a symbol of right libertarianism, classical libertarianism, and small government, as well as for distrust or defiance against authorities and government. And, of course, is also a piece of evidence of reptilian control. Now, in ancient Egypt, we have the symbol of Sobek, also known as Sukkus. Was an ancient Egyptian deity with complex and elastic history in nature. He is associated with sacred and Nile crocodiles, and is often represented as a crocodile-headed humanoid, if not as a crocodile outright. Sobek was also associated with pharaonic power, fertility, and military prowess, but served additionally as a protective deity with apotropaic qualities, invoked especially for protection against the dangers presented by the Nile. And that's, of course, as far as I'm going to read here, but this is just more in the pattern of evidence. Next we have Medusa or also called Gorgo, or the Gorgon, was one of the three Gorgons. Medusa is generally described as a woman with living snakes in place of hair. Her appearance was so hideous that anyone who looked upon her was turned to stone. Medusa and her Gorgon sisters, Uriel and Stheno, were also described as daughters of Phorcys and Seto. Of the three, only Medusa was mortal. Medusa was beheaded by the Greek hero Perseus, who then used her head, which retained its ability to turn onlookers to stone as a weapon until he gave it to the goddess Athena to place on her shield. In classical antiquity, the image of the head of Medusa is appeared on the evil averting device known as the Gorgonian, according to, well, actually the rest of it doesn't really matter. But either way, the idea of the Gorgon could not perfectly describe what we know today as a council. But in this context, it would be a council of reptilians, of which most city councils or councils otherwise today appear to, in fact, act out of a reptilian nature. They are incredibly... Um, hostile to anyone who deviate from social norms or behavior at any of their pub so-called public meetings. They get very retractive when those people do anything out of turn, not so much the reason for it, but rather the simple uh, effect it has upon the environment. As any teacher would say, the disruption of the class. And all of those are very strong signs of reptilian nature. Next we have the House of Medici, 
was an Italian banking family and political dynasty that first consolidated power in the Republic of Florence under Cosimo de' Medici during the first half of the 15th century. The family originated in the Mugolo region of Tuscany and prospered gradually until it was able to fund the Medici Bank. This bank was the largest in Europe during the 15th century and facilitated the Medici's rise to political power in Florence, although they officially remained citizens rather than monarchs until the 16th century. Now, of course, this relates to the concept of the bloodline families. And, of course, the uh, Medici has similar contrast to the Medusa with their um, council, uh, their hierarchical order structures, and, of course, uh, many of their activities and the way that they went about doing things has a strong resemblance to a reptilian hierarchical structure. Next, you have medicine, which many argue comes from the word Medici. The C being the major difference there. You could say Medici, considering it's spelled with a C, and you, of course, get medicine, or medicine. It's a science and practice of caring for patients, managing the diagnosis, prognosis, prevention, treatment, palliation of their injury or disease, and promoting their health. Medicine encompasses a variety of healthcare practices involved to maintain and restore health by the prevention and treatment of illness. Contemporary medicine applies biomedical sciences, biomedical research, genetics, and medical technology to diagnose, treat, prevent injury and disease, typically through pharmaceuticals or surgery, but also through the therapies as diverse as psychotherapy, external splints and traction, metal devices, biolab, blah, blah, blah. And, of course, notice, naturally, that the symbol of the World Health Organization contains a snake wrapped around a pole, usually referred to as the caduceus. Now, BlackRock and the, its operations, they bear a striking resemblance to that idea of the black eye of a serpent and its capability to hypnotize or paralyze, or in another way, say, turn to stone, as it's called black rock, any that look upon it. Now, in the video game of Elder Scrolls, uh, of which there are many renditions, Argonians, or Soxlil, are an oviparous race of reptilian people native to the large and marshy province of Tamriel, known as Black Marsh. They can be found in smaller numbers throughout the continent. Argonians are one of the few races completely unrelated to men and mare. Think of themselves as coming from and ultimately returning to the hist. Enigmatic and intelligent, the Argonians are experts of guerrilla tactics and their natural abilities suit their swampy homeland. They have developed immunities to disease that have plagued many would-be explorers in the region, and they are capable of easily exploring underwater locations due to their ability to breathe water. Argonians also have some resistance to poison. Now, in the video game Mass Effect, there is a race known as the Turian. Known for their militaristic and disciplined culture, the Turians were the third race to join the Citadel Council. They gained their council seat after defeating the hostile Krogan for the council during the Krogan rebellions. The Turians deployed a Solarian-created biological weapon called the Genophage, which virtually sterilized the Krogan and sent them into decline. The Turians then filled the peacekeeping niche left by the once cooperative Krogan and eventually gained a council seat in recognition of their efforts. Originally from the planet Palavin, Turians are best known for their military role, particularly their contributions of soldiers and starships to the Citadel fleet. They are respected for their public service ethic. It was the Turians who first proposed creating CSEC, but are sometimes seen as imperialist or rigid by other races. There is some animosity between Turians and humans, largely due to the Turian role in the first contact war. This bitterness is slowly beginning to heal, as shown by the cooperation of two races on the construction of the SSB Normandy. But many Turians still resent humans and vice versa. Next, the second species to join the Citadel, the Solarians, are warm-blooded amphibians native to the planet Sirkesh. Solarians possess a hyperactive metabolism. They think fast, talk fast, and move fast. To Solarians, other species seem sluggish and dull-witted, especially the Elkhor. Unfortunately, their meta me metabolic speed leaves them with relatively short lifespan. Solarians over the age of 40 are a rarity. Solarians are known for their observational capability and nonlinear thinking. This manifests as an aptitude for research and espionage. They are constantly experimenting and inventing, and it is generally accepted that they always know more than they are letting on. Next, there are the Krogan, a species of large reptilian bipeds native to the planet Tichaka. 
A world known for its harsh environment, scarce resources, and overabundance of vicious predators, the Krogan managed to not only survive on their unforgiving homeworld, but actually thrived in the extreme conditions. Unfortunately, as Krogan society became more technologically advanced, so did their weaponry. The end result is that they destroyed their homeworld in nuclear war that reduced their race into primitive warring tribes. With the help of the Salarians, the Krogan were uplifted into galactic society and lent their numbers and military prowess to bring an end to the Rockne Wars. Ironically, after the Rockne were educated, the rapidly expanding Krogan became a threat to the galaxy in turn, starting the Krogan rebellions and forcing the Turians to unleash the genophage. This genetic infection dramatically reduced fertility in Krogan females, causing a severe drop in births secondary to prenatal and postnatal death, and ultimately eliminating the Krogan's numerical advantage. And so this concept that we get from Mass Effect shows, in fact, conflict between reptilian species. Next there is there are the Drell, a reptile-like race that were rescued from their dying homeward by the Hanar, following first contact between the two. Since then, the Drell have remained loyal to the Hanar for their camaraderie and have fit comfortably into galactic civilization. And in Mass Effect, as referenced before, the Citadel Council, which is made up of mostly reptilians, uh, being two reptilians, one human. And then there's a third entity of blue people. Here, the Asari, native to the planet Thessia, are often considered the most influential and respected sentient species in the galaxy and are known for their elegance, diplomacy, and biotic aptitude. This is partly due to the fact that the Asari were among the earliest races to achieve interstellar flight after the Protheans and first to discover and settle the Citadel. The monogender race, the Asari, are distinctively feminine in appearance and possess maternal instincts. Their unique physiology, expressed in a millennium-long lifespan and the ability to to reproduce with the partner of any gender or species, gives them a conservative yet convivial attitude towards other races. Favoring compromise and cooperation over conflict, the Asari were instrumental in proposing and founding the Citadel Council and have been at the heart of galactic society ever since. And so here we deviate a little bit from the emphasis on the reptilian uh, social order. Now, in the TV show Farscape, there are the Delvians, which were a species of sentient humanoid plant plants hailing from the planet Delvia, recognizable by their blue skin that was dotted with light green patterns. In accordance with their plant origins, Delvians rarely exhibit body hair. Only a few were seen to have any body hair at all. Solar radiation like the light of the sun or a nebulae caused a very pleasurable effect on their bodies known as photogasm. While they are plant-based species, Delvians, Delvians can draw energy from meat in their diet. Under ideal conditions, Delvians don't need to ingest meat. However, if faced with starvation, their natural physiology allows them to act in a carnivorous fashion. This transformation only occurs when they have not eaten other foods for too long, causing their bodies to eventually switch into self-defense mode that requires meat to switch out again. In this defense mode, the Delvian's body begins to shut down and automatically produces flowering buds that exude a highly toxic pollen. So, the other, of course, the, the contrast here is the fact of a blue-colored race. And also, in the context of the TV show, this species was capable of uh, advanced, sort of, well, what we consider advanced, in most cases, neurological uh, melding, like the mind meld uh, that you find in Star Trek with Spock, basically. Now, naturally, in ancient Egypt, you have Amun, who is a major Egyptian deity who appears as a member of the Hermopotamus Politan Ogdoad. Amun was attested from the Old Kingdom, together with his wife Amunet. His oracle and Siwa oasis, located western Egypt near the Libyan desert, remained the only oracle of Amun throughout. With the uh, 11th dynasty, Amun rose to the position of patron city or deity of Thebes by replacing Montu. Initially, po and possibly one of the eight deities in the Hermopolite creation myth, his worship expanded after a rebellion of Thebes against the Hyksos. And with the rule of Amos I, Amun acquired national importance expressed in his fusion with the sun god Ra. With Amun-Ra, alternatively spelled Amun-Ra or Amun-Re, on his own, he was also thought to be the king of gods. And naturally, this entity is depicted in with a bluish skin color. Next, of course, we're going to turn to the aspect of dogs, considering the previous story that we looked at of Beowulf, and the inclusion of the wolf concept as the villain instead of the hero in the story of Little Red Riding Hood. You have the four dogs of Timujin, also called Genghis Khan, 
One of the most chilling passages in military history in the 13th century secret history of the Mongols, Genghis Khan's quartet of elite generals are described thus. They are the four dogs, Timujin. And these are called Jebe, Kublai, Chalme, and Subota. Of course, that would cause some uh, confusion, considering the name Kublai from the TV show about Marco Polo. This, of course, would have to be somebody different, considering that Kublai apparently is a much later descendant of Timujin long after he was dead. Naturally, we have the concept of the werewolf, or if you want to split the two words up, werewolf, which is the idea of a man being able to transform into a wolf, of which we also find present in the Harry Potter series. And then in ancient Egypt, you have the depiction of Anubis, a humanoid, apparently canine entity, very long ears and a long snout, which actually resembles much closer to the Shilat Squintly canine of uh, Mexico and um, many other versions, such as the the uh, Peruvian Inca Orchid, a small dog which looks a lot like the much larger Shilat Squintly, and resembles almost completely, strikingly, the appearance of Anubis. And I have done a video on that before. Now, when it comes to the hunting of a reptile, we can learn a lot from the methods of a cat. This is not just for the determinate, not for the ability to kill a snake, but also for the determination that you are in fact dealing with a reptile. See, a cat does not have the same speed of a cobra or some other animal, whereas mongoose, mongoose of which that name is really weird, considering the use of the word geese and goose to resemble some sort of avian creature, but mon being the prefix for one, so mon geese is a bit weird sounding. And also, of course, that relates to a kind of a vermin, rat-like, or fox-like creature. More like a ferret, I suppose. But that is usually referred to as the ultimate adversary of snakes. But in most contexts, it's actually the house cat. House cats are known to kill many snakes, and even venomous ones of a lethal nature. Cats, different to other animals, watch their prey and associate their attack pattern according to that prey. Rather than attacking every animal in turn, a cat will approach a snake differently than a mouse, rat, or some other type of creature. Usually they will fake uh, attack, usually as we see with the uh, faint padding of their, their um, paw. This will instigate an attack from the snake. Snakes, when they attack, are fully committed to every attack. They only have one move, and they might strike very quickly, but once they're committed, they cannot then immediately retreat. And then the cat, after it gets the snake to strike, will then go around and bite its head off. Because the snake, being fully committed, is then open to a committed attack from the cat. And the cat starts this first by faking an attack, which in turn gains the reaction from the snake. Now we will come and look at the idea of the serpent tine tongue, or speech patterns and ways in which the serpent and reptiles in general might communicate, not just through the rigid structure, but the natural form that they might. We'll start with the concept of the forked tongue, a distinctly snake-like uh, colloquialism. And the Cambridge Dictionary says is to tell lies or say one thing and mean something else. The second part I would say is more applicable because a snake naturally would not lie. But the idea of having a forked tongue and being able to say two things at once is very reptilian. You might not be lying, and that's where you can say one thing but mean double or multiple, have multiple meanings to that one thing. But you might not technically be lying, although it is usually used in the idea of deceit. But in the context of two societies running in parallel, the capability to say one thing and mean separate things would be very important.
Next, we have the term silver tongue, which refers to someone who speaks in a clever and well-spoken manner, often with great skill at persuading others to believe what they say or do what they want. And it's usually used in the same and similar context as the word forked tongue. And naturally, we also have the third element of snake oil. And notice, of course, all of the reptilian context of deceit, being able to say one thing and mean something else at the same time. Snake oil is a term used to describe deceptive marketing, healthcare fraud, or a scam. And of course, as we notice, the snake is the prominent symbol under the healthcare system of today. Similarly, snake oil salesman is a common label used to describe someone who sells, promotes, or is a general proponent of some valueless or fraudulent cure, remedy, or solution. The term comes from the snake oil that used to be sold as a cure-all elixir for many kinds of physiological problems. Many 18th century European and 19th century United States entrepreneurs advertised and sold mineral oil, often mixed with various active and inactive household herbs, spices, drugs, and compounds, but containing no snake derived, derived substances whatsoever as snake oil liniment. Making claims about its efficiency as a panacea, patient, patent medicines that claimed to be a panacea were extremely common from the 18th century until the 20th century, particularly among vendors masking addicts addictive drugs such as cocaine, amphetamine, alcohol, and opium-based concoctions or elixirs to be sold at medicine shows as medication or products promoting health. And of course, that stuff is possibly even more so today than it was then. Now, Harry Potter is a, a seemingly useful resource when studying the uh, implications of these kinds of reptilian societies, in which in Harry Potter you have partial tongue, the ability to speak to snakes, uh, reptiles specifically, uh, shared between the protagonist and antagonist of the series. Naturally, a snake-like language would have a lot to do with melody, considering the ability to charm snakes has a lot to do with melodic rhythm. And of course, hypnosis, we find the elements of that type of perspective in most of our apparent music that we listen to today, which has melody combined with words, as you find in church structures, and in some cases even school, in which it's essentially used as sort of behavioral modifier or way to hypnotize those that are present. Now, as far as the uh, effects of this forked tongue narrative onto uh, most of our culture and stories in our own language, as we saw before with the Beowulf tale, and Little Red Riding Hood. Also, we find this similar forked tongue at work when it comes to the concept of the afterlife, usually depicted as taking a boat over a body of water, or perhaps along the river Styx. There are many other versions. There is the ferryman of sailor legend, where a sailor dies and they're then in turn taken by the ferryman. And this pops up among many cultures across the planet. Logically, this is where the tale of the angel comes from, and its depiction with the Valkyrie, which instead of being a woman, of which most vessels are considered and representative as women, as the figurehead usually contains a woman on it, and of course there's the mermaid, well, they're also winged. And in Spanish, the word for a sail is a la which also means wing. Now, the context of boats, wings, sails, the ark, all of these things, they all wrap together into one when you recognize the patterns and that the obfuscation around these concepts is because they have some sort of basis in reality and understanding, which any sort of reptilian control hierarchical structure would not want known among the as they see it, their livestock. Now, another interesting element that has been obfuscated but is very apparent are the symbols of the man and woman, where the male symbol is a circle with a arrow pointing up to the right and the woman an essentially upside down cross in the center. Both of these symbols are present in the eagle globe and anchor of the United States Marine Corps. However, they're inverse. The anchor makes an arrow over a circle, but it's pointing down to the bottom left, whereas the eagle makes an upturned cross on the top rather than the downturned cross 
of the female symbol, but both of these are incorporated into the same one, which is uh, a strong indicator that what we know of male and female symbols is likely wrong. Now we come to the word petite, which is in, in French, it means it's an adjective meaning small, little, or short in stature. And this definition comes from weinfrance.com. However, that is not an accurate definition to the actual use of that word, such as a petite uh, council or petty council does not actually have to do with, say, its stature, considering most of them were very high up. There are important councils uh, in Game of Thrones. They're called the small council, and they were the highest of councils, in fact, above other councils as well. Petite is used in many other forms in French to mean something that does not actually fit into the translated definition of the word. Now, if you, if you look up just petite, here you get essentially the same reciprocation of the same definition and the same perspective is that petite has to do specifically with a woman's size. And so here you have a strong emphasis on the use of the word petite only in relation to its use as a word for small. Next, you have the word Paul. Now, before we look at the definitions here and their obvious similarities to the word petite, it would also be important to notice the word bon appetit and the clear use of the word petite as uh, our der derivation of our word appetite meaning hunger. Now, the word Paul is apparently a name, a boy's name, of Latin origin meaning small. Here it says, Roman family named Paulus or Paulus from the Latin adjective meaning small, humble, least, or little. And so here, of course, we find the similarity, pretty strong, between the word Paul and French petite. And obviously, their focus on the fact that it means small in stature. Now this contrasts strongly to the character Paul Bunyan. is a giant lumberjack, so not small, and folk hero in American and Canadian folklore. His tall tales revolve around his superhuman labors and he is customarily accompanied by the baby Babe the Blue Ox, his pet and working animal. The character originated in the oral tradition of North American loggers and was later popularized by freelance writer William B. Loghead. Really? It's called Loghead. And a 1916 promotional pamphlet for the Red River Lumber Company. And as with most of this stuff, you have so many markers here. For one, it's a writer named Loghead. For two, it's Red River Company, Lumber Company, right? Red, like a little red riding hood. Paul Bunyan is depicted as wearing red and black, usually in flannel shirt. His uh, ox is colored blue. And his name is Paul, but he's a giant. Next, we have the alleged uh, American legend of Paul Revere. He was an American silversmith, military officer, and industrialist who played a major role during the opening months of the American Revolutionary War in Massachusetts, engaging in midnight ride in 1775 to alert nearby Minutemen of the approach of British troops prior to the battles of Lexington and Concord. Now, I'm not going to waste any time with all of the other nonsense around this and all the obfuscation of words. Essentially, the forked silver tongue reptile we find in most propaganda pieces. Paul Revere, just like Paul Bunyan, did not actually exist as we understand it, as we're taught the literal definition of what these two concepts are. It's very clear that they are obfuscating something of relative importance, which they do not want the human mass of their livestock to um, understand. Paul Revere, now we've looked at the word Paul, well, Revere has something to do with Reveille, or Reveille. There's different, of course, ways to say it, depending on which form of French you're using, which means to wake up. Now, here Wikipedia, Reveille, in French, le rêve, 
is a bugle call, trumpet call, drum fife, and drum or pipes call most often associated with the military. It is chiefly used to wake military personnel at sunrise. The name comes from réveille or réveille, the French word for wake up. Now, what exactly did Paul Revere do again? The tunes used in the Commonwealth of Nations are different from the ones used in the United States, but they are used in analogous ways to ceremonially start the day. British Army Cavalry and Royal Horse Artillery Regiments sound a call different from the infantry versions known as the Roos, but often misnamed Reveille. While most Scottish regiments of the British Army sound pipes call the same name to the tune of Hey Johnny Cope, Are Ye Waking Yet? A tune that commemorates the Battle of Prespons, Preston Pans for the Black Watch since the Crimean War. Now, of course, this is also the easiest way to determine whether or not somebody was actually active duty or stationed in any sort of military base, because, of course, you know, the descendants of military men and women might have been stationed on bases where exactly at, uh, I believe, 7 a.m., I mean, it might vary depending on which time zone and whatnot, but either way, at 7 a.m., it sounds reveille is how we say it. Rebel. And um, especially if you were in the Marine Corps, you should be able to, you know, that tune by heart for many reasons, but usually running from it. Because when you get caught out in Reveille, you have to stand at attention until the song is over, which for some reason is worse than gunfire. Now, the Roos is an interesting name, considering it could also be called the Rouse or to rouse someone meaning to wake them up, but also the Kievan Rus being the word for those of uh, Eastern European origin. And then, of course, you also have various German last names of Raus, Raus, or Rausch. Now, the next concept we're going to look at is what would be considered the cloaking device, the thing that actually physically changes the form of reptilian hierarchical societal controllers why they would appear as something other than reptiles. And of course, as we know with the chameleon, the reptiles are well known as experts in camouflage. To start with, we should get a comprehension of the visible spectrum. According to Wikipedia, the visible spectrum is the band of the electromagnetic spectrum that is visible to the human eye. Of course, it could be visible to other things. Electromagnetic radiation in this range of wavelengths is called visible light or simply light. The optical spectrum is sometimes considered to be the same as the visible spectrum, but some authors define the term more broadly to include the ultraviolet and infrared parts of the electromagnetic spectrum as well, known collectively as optical radiation. A typical human eye will respond to the wavelength from about 380 to 750 nanometers. In terms of frequency, this corresponds to a band in the vicinity of 400 to 79 terahertz, or 790. These boundaries are not sharply defined and may vary per individual. Under optimal conditions, these limits of human perception can extend uh, to 310 nm ultraviolet and 1100 nm near infrared. The spectrum does not contain all the colors that the human visual system can distinguish. Unsaturated colors such as pink or purple variations like magenta, for example, are absent because they can only be made from a mix of multiple wavelengths. Colors containing only one wavelength are also called pure colors or spectral colors. Naturally, when it comes to the optic nerve of the human eye, the ability to trick it, as it were, or any other optic nerves of other animals, is to understand how you would bend light. Now, simple uh, explanation of this could be found, of course, in camouflage paint of military forces, in which you have to associate your paint with the environment that you'll be in, understanding how the light patterns will be seen. Splashes for jungle or long-leafed environments, Splotches for wider leafed environments like uh, coniferous forest, etc. And you might need something different for the desert. Like you probably would want green face paint in the desert because that's not a natural color that you usually find in the desert. And it, the same goes, of course, with reptiles. Reptiles will be able to change themselves in their coloring to the environment that they will be found in. This, of course, has to do with the essential idea of bending light. And when you understand that, especially in a completely ingrained natural form as a reptile might have, well, then the idea of bending light to trick the human optic nerve becomes relatively simple. Now, when it comes to bending light, there's a lot of concepts that go into it. 
there is diffraction, deflection. Uh, there's the, well, there's many ideas about this. And it is so easy to see in water where your hand might appear much larger than it actually is because of the differential dispersion of light waves through water. Of course, as any diver would know, once you get to certain levels, you start losing colors in the ocean or a lake or any other large body of water. This all comes down to the understanding of light bending. And this would be different among reptilians, considering some would be amphibious and others would not. But either way, all would have some kind of idea about how light and the appearance of light works. Now, red is a very important color on the light spectrum, and its use can be found all over the place in stop signs, stop lights, all which are red, ambulances, which incorporate red, as well as police and so-called first responders. Then you have red in safety lights, which come on after power goes out in many certain installations and facilities. And then, of course, infrared, which does appear, in fact, as red and is used to see in the dark. As we know, many reptiles do have that capability of nocturnal sight, in which they need very little light. There is no actual, as far as I'm aware, capability of actually seeing in pure darkness, of which no light is present, because even infrared and night vision uh, mechanisms, they require some light in the environment, even the smallest amount. And that is where the concept of infrared uh, night vision based uh, where, in the military anyway, where that comes from. But also in the Game of Thrones series, there is the Red Woman, who, as far as the TV show goes, is seen as changing her appearance through the use of a choker, which is colored red. Of course, she wears red clothing and serves the Lord of Light. And I would suggest that the Lord of Light which also is in correlation to the words Lucifer or Satan, is actually a device with which reptiles and other creatures can in fact change the appearance of their form. They do not actually change their form. They instead bend the light around their form to appear as something different. You find other elements that relate to this concept. The Varangian Guards, Norse origins. In the early stages, the Varangian Guard, an organization primarily comprised of Norsemen and Rus, were a distinct Norse character. This identity persisted until the late 11th century when significant changes began to take place. According to the late Swedish historian Alf Henriksen, in his work Sven Historia, or Svensk, History of Sweden, the Norse Varangian Guardsmen possessed identifiable features such as long hair, a ruby, red ruby, adorning the left ear, and ornate dragon motifs stitched into their chainmail shirts. That ruby earring would be an important note. Of course, beyond a choker and an earring, you also have elements of rubies being set into rings, which could, of course, naturally depict a sort of light-bending device. Now, there's a lot more that comes into cloaking beyond just appearance. You have Something called pattern of life analysis is a method of surveillance that documents or understands the habits of a person or population. Motives may include security, profit, scientific research, regular census, and traffic analysis. The data of interest may reflect anything in a person's or person's life, their travels, purchases, internet browsing habit, choices, and so forth. The data is used to predict a subject's future action or to detect anomalous behavior. Now, of course, there's many examples of this, which this Wikipedia article goes into. However, the concept here is that even though your appearance might say something, the patterns might say otherwise. And so if you're trying to pass yourself off as something else, and let alone try to pass yourself off as a different species, then the patterns might be a little bit more difficult to present. As the saying goes, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, then it's a duck. So if you want, if you're not a duck and you want to be a duck, then you also have to do those things, walk like one and talk like one. Next comes the concept of, of course, when inevitably you lose your identity, you need to do something called saving face. And according to Cambridge, to keep your reputation and avoid others losing respect for you, we said he left to pursue other interests to let him save face, but actually we fired him. Now this idea of saving a face can be seen pretty strongly in the wearing of masks and that pattern as we saw earlier. 
saving your face is basically lying, but it's the retention of a false identity, which would be a requirement when somebody notices something that's out of pattern because it's not just enough to change appearance. However, the concept of saving face is a nice way of saying lying to preserve false identity is an exactly and perfect example of the double speak concept of a forked tongue. Now, apart from the element of being able to rescue a identity that is being called into question, the idea of being able to associate your patterns to the appearance that you're attempting to pass yourself off, well, when you're hiding and you're cloaking yourself to an environment, as reptiles would naturally know, the best way to do it would actually be to shape your environment for your benefit. When you're camouflaging yourself in the military, you usually do this by uh, moving foliage around and trying to cover up, say, your fighting hole. Uh, of course, it could take other aspects, such as actual construction of buildings that all look alike in order to hide one particular location. Of course, also distortions and anomalies in reality could serve as distractions rather than trying to shape the entire environment. You simply move someone's attention somewhere else, such as would be the idea behind the illogical and ridiculous solar farms and wind farms. Well, apart from all the other uh, reasons behind those things, they can serve as distractions, which instead of trying to shape an environment to hide yourself, like the concept with the buildings or the fighting hole, instead you make sure that your enemy or opponent or whoever you're trying to keep from noticing is looking somewhere else. Now, naturally, uh, reptiles, the same with chameleons, but really snakes and others in general, they tend to patiently incorporate themselves into the landscape of various environments, and it's usually only presented as a defense mechanism. It doesn't have to be. But the general idea of fearfulness and being run by fear of discovery, that is inherent into reptilian nature. And we find that in most of our society today. Of course, other animals, rather than a lack, of, rather than through fear or some other thing, other animals have very perfect natural abilities for camouflage. The cat is a primary example of this, not just the tiger, whose apparent color spectrum should not logically blend into the environment, but usually does. But house cats. They can be very stealthy and capable of blending into their environments as well. There are many other creatures and animals out there who understand how this works. But there is a particular nature to the way with which reptiles do it. Cat will do it for a different purpose than out of fear of discovery. A cat will do it out of a predatory instinct so that their prey does not see them coming. But they do not fear discovery, because some often when you discover a cat has been hiding, they do not shrink up, move away, or react strongly to disturbances in the environment. Now we come to the concept of the war, which is a one of expansive and interplanetary nature. It takes part in many different areas and across many different sectors. To begin with, we will start with the component of this, the component of this main war, which is the component of the reptilian civil war. Essentially a split between different reptile groups, and the split would have been caused, uh, as far as the evidence would suggest, from the intervention of the binary entity or the implications of its use as a technology some sort of intervention force or intervention in the environment caused a rift, a division between the reptilian societies that control our main one, and they essentially began to fight each other. Now this war takes place in many areas and can be seen in many different ways. One thing, of course, that the secret reptilian society will want us to do is to not 
see it happening because once others and their livestock and humans start waking up to the fact that there is a war happening, well, then we can become uh, an element in it that's damaging and threatening their control structure. Now, the control structure, the preservation of the hierarchical order, is so paramount in such a reptilian society that they would rather destroy everything than lose it. They will sacrifice themselves for the preservation of such order. The most important thing of all is the preservation of that order. Other reptilians do not agree with this. And so we find that element in, in the Mass Effect series in which you have reptilians fighting each other for different motives or otherwise. Some have associated themselves essentially with the binary entity, but it's hard to tell exactly who's on what side and how many sides there actually are. Now, the wars and the weapons of this war take place in many forms and in many areas. Of course, most of our modes of warfare today have a strongly reptilian character to them. However, the wars that we have been seeing go on planet side on in terrestrial format could be only one subject component of a interspatial war taking place across multiple spheres. And it is not only physical. We also have cyber war, which has now been introduced and well comprehended, despite the fact that a lot of the preservation of the social order has focused on the fact of, <coughs> of um, managing perception around that particular topic of warfare waged on other fronts and out of the, outside of the physical realm. Now, the weapons of warfare, of which we'll start with Harry Potter, have a distinctly serpentine look to them, such as the wands in Harry Potter, which not only are they cylindrical and long, like the tooth of a serpent, but they also project things from the points, which also bears a striking resemblance to the uh, lethal injection type of weapon. Now, of course, missiles also bear the same resemblance, except instead of something coming out the front, something comes out the back. And they are also explosive. But either way, they are long and thing-like. Now, rockets, which apparently are used to uh, shuttle people into space, which is highly unlikely, are shaped similar to missiles and also, of course, to vaccines and many other types of uh, weapons that we see today, and then most likely, as many believe, the rockets that we see being shot into space are not actually rockets, but instead are weapons more akin to the missile, but in a much larger scale. Now, logically, these rockets being sent out into space, as if they are missiles, are being sent against something. And that's where we can look, turn to Mass Effect and look at the mass relays again. This idea of shooting these things down we come to the fact that there is an attempt in the preservation of the order to keep any sort of outside force from intervening against it. And that's where the attacks against something out there would come from. Now this would come down to the idea of a mass interconnected system across multiple galaxies across the entire universe, essentially. Imagine, if you will, a planet-sized computer computing server. Sort of data center that is essentially the size of a planet like the Death Star, except instead of just one, there are so many, and they're not designed as weapons, but simply as interconnected processing centers. And then these send out relays, or as for Mass Effect, mass relays, of which they can essentially easier, more easily project the uh, signals and code and all of those other things throughout the universe throughout space and time. These relays for any hierarchical reptilian social order would be a threat, and so they must be removed. However, they, as we see with the cloaking device, would try to adopt these things into their social order to try and control and maintain the hierarchical structure. And so that's where you get the subset use of the binary which uh, is essentially a computer program, a malicious computer program designed to uh, ret either retain the order and control or essentially burn everything to the ground. Whereas this entity that we're talking about, this sort of interspatial connected computing system, 
is not neither bad nor good, but instead is affected as the definition of artificial intelligence is constructed by everything in the environment. It changes and reprograms itself continuously through whatever inputs are made. And so, in fact, everybody's input affects this machine. Whether you are, however you act throughout your day, every day, has is inputted into this system of which our internet is connected to it. And this, of course, has to do with radio frequency and signals and possibly other types of mechanisms that are beyond most of our limited comprehension as we are under this reptilian control structure. And this gives us a context for the matrix in which the character Neo, of which the subsequent two other movies and other spinoffs attempt to obfuscate, was able to reprogram the agents through interaction and understanding how the system works. And that same concept can be applied to a sort of interspatial connected computing system, which is neither evil nor, nor good, but entirely depends upon the interactivity with it. <laughs>